ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونؤمن به ونتوكل عليه ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا وسيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله اما بعد فإن خير الحديث كتاب الله تعالى وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الأمور محدثاتها كل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار All praise is due to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the one who is truly worthy of all praise We praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and whilst we praise him, we acknowledge our, acknowledge our deficiency in praising him. He is as he has praised himself. And in the same breath, we thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for all of the blessings that he has bestowed upon us. For Allah is the source of all blessings. And peace and salutations upon the Messenger of Allah, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent as a mercy to all of the alameen. Dear brothers and sisters, last week, we discussed one of the stories that the Prophet ﷺ told us about one of the nations that came before us. And this is a story which is full of lessons. And it is a story that in itself emanates from it sober patience upon Iman. Patience upon Iman. And giving dawah to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala despite all of the difficulties that a person may have to face. And the story is about a young child, a young boy. And his patience and his dawah to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calling people to the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And in this story, we learn that this boy was chosen to trained to be a sorcerer for the king and when he would go to the sorcerer to study his sorcery on the way he would meet a monk and he would sit with the monk and learn from the monk until he was convinced by the message of the monk and he accepted the true religion of the time and then one day he decided to test that whilst he believed in it he wanted to see with his own eyes, this truth manifests itself. And so he made dua to Allah and he killed the lion which was holding the people uh, away from their path and restricting their movement. So he killed the lion by throwing a stone at it. And as a result of that, the monk who was his teacher advised him, saying to him, first of all, that you are better than me and that now the message that you have it will become known and then the king will search for you and he will harm you so when you are caught don't tell them about me one of the things that perhaps we didn't mention was that the monk wasn't fearful for himself he was fearful that he is the source of that dawa and if he is killed then the dawa will be removed there's the same thing we find amongst the companions of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. An example of that Sayyidina Abu Bakr When he's traveling with the Prophet in the Hijrah, you find him, he's always at the forefront, anticipating any arrow that might come, that he might stand in front of it, and shield the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So you find him riding behind the Prophet <coughs> riding to the right of him, to the left of him, in front of him for fear of this. And in the same way the companions, all of the companions of the Prophet ﷺ. In the same way, this monk, he was the da'i to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's religion in this area. So he must be protected at all costs. The story continues that this ghulam, <coughs> Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continued to show in his hands karamat, miracles. As the narration mentions, that he would cure the people from various illnesses. And this is one of the hikam of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's wisdoms 
that he might cause at the hand of a person some things to manifest themselves. They are from Allah entirely. And that person has no role in that except that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives him tasbih. It's bad, you know, makes him thabit in his deed, in his iman. And also it is a sign that the person is upon the truth. Not like the other people who come with magic and illusion and trickery. But this is something which is real and mangoes. So this boy began to cure the people. He would come to him and he would cure them. And as a result of that, he became well known to the extent that a man who was amongst the people who used to sit with the king heard about this boy who was curing people. And he had become blind. So he hoped to find cure with this boy. So he came to him with many presents. And he presented his presence to him and he said, this is nothing. There is so much more. Cure me of my blindness. So the boy in return replied to him. He said, فَقَالَ إِنِّي لَا أَشْفِي أَحَدًا إِنَّمَا يَشْفِي اللَّهِ فَإِنْ أَنْتَ آمَنْتَ بِاللَّهِ دَعَوْتُ اللَّهِ فَشَفَاكَ He said, I'm not the one who cures, but Allah is the one who cures. And if you believe in Allah, I will make dua to Allah for you. And Allah will cure you. And this is another lesson that we should learn from this. That all good, it should always be denoted to Allah. Because Allah is the source of all good. And likewise, all evil should not be denoted to Allah. This is not maqam al-adab with Allah, that any ill should be denoted to Allah. But all good, the source of all good is Allah alone. And that's the effect of Tawheed and Iman upon a person, that he should do this, that he should denote all good to Allah. And he should not denote all evil to Allah. Whilst all things are only by the hawl of Allah, tabarak wa ta'ala, it is quwa. Everything is from Allah. But the impact of Iman upon a person is that he should denote good only to Allah. So this boy, he said, I'm not the one who cures, Allah is the one who cures. And at the head of all of those is the, our father Ibrahim alayhi salam. What does he say? وَإِذَا مَرِدْتُ فَهُوَ يَشْفِي And when I become ill, he is the one who cures me. Allah is the one who cures illnesses. These other things that we have, medicines, they are all a means. The cure is in the hand of Allah alone. The other thing that we find also that this Ghulam, he had no desire for these things of the dunya that were presented to him as gifts. He had what we call zuhud, zuhud fi dunya. And this is something which causes a person, if he has this, if Allah gives him this zuhud, that the people love him because Allah loves him. Allah puts love in the hearts of the people. The Prophet also said, that if you want the people to love you, they don't love this dunya and don't take up this dunya. And Allah will cause the people to love you. <coughs> Zuhud. This man had no interest in the presents that were bought to him. But he had a hadith which was greater than that, which was what? The Imam of this person who had come to bring him to faith. <coughs> so we find that this is one of also one of the tools of a Look at the Anbiya of Allah. The Anbiya of Allah, when they came to their people and made da'wah to them, one of the things that you find Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala orders them, or if he tells us about them, is that they always say that I don't ask you for any reward. In ajriya illa ala Allah. My reward is with Allah alone. And this goes to show what ikhlas. So that the person who is being told <coughs> realizes this person's ikhlas. That he doesn't have any other in the, motives behind his da'wah except to call the person to iman. So we find that as a result of that this boy's da'wah calling this man to Islam was accepted. And this what was a good show? Ikhlas. When there is ikhlas, <coughs> the da'wah will be accepted. And this is why it's very important that when we are calling to Allah, and all of us are calling to Allah, it's not just the shaykh's responsibility, the imam's responsibility, it's everybody's responsibility. If you are an engineer, it's your responsibility. 
If you are a doctor, it's your responsibility. If you drive a taxi, it's your responsibility. If you are a student, it's your responsibility. Everybody's responsibility to call to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In their own way and in their own capacity. Maybe not all are equal in the way that they call. But we are all ambassadors to Islam. We all call to Islam. Brothers and sisters, we find that as a result of that, this Jalees of the king became a Muslim. And this is the effect of the ikhlas of this man when he became a Muslim, uh, or he became upon the true religion, which is Islam. That you find that this man also, the impact of that was what? That he found in that comfort, <coughs> happiness. And he was happy to make that known to the people. And it goes to show another thing. If we looked at the affairs of the world, the situation of the world at the moment, you find that somebody might be called to the wrong religion because of what is given to them. Maybe people are in a state of poverty. Maybe they don't have water. So a group of people, like we see in Africa, Group of non-Muslims go to Africa with their money and they dig a well and give people water. And they bring their food packages and their medicines. And what happens? They convert people from the true religion to the false religion. Africa was Muslim. What happened to the Africans? Don't blame the Africans. Don't blame those people. We are the ones to blame. Where were the Muslims? Where was our food parcels and our medicines and our water pumps? If there is blame on them, then there is blame on us. But look at this young boy who is a dai in Allah. He doesn't want any of the things of the dunya. He is calling what he is more harris with is the iman of the people. So he calls his man to Islam and his man accepts the Islam. And he, as a result of that, now is going from a phase of a dawah sidriya to a dawah jahdi. Before this, the devil was hidden. The Rahi was saying, don't tell the king. But this boy has made it all. To the extent that the people are coming to him to cure, to seek cure. And this Jalees of the king is one of those people who was affected by this Dao of this young boy. So now, the cell is going to be opened up. The secret is going to be revealed. So the narration mentions the person said, فَأَتَ الْمَلِكْ فَجَلَسَ إِلَيْهِ كَمَا كَانَ يَجْلِسْ فَقَالَ لَهُ الْمَلِكْ مَنْ رَدَّ عَلَيْكَ بَصَرْ So when he came to the king and he sat with the king, the king realized that his sight has been returned. So he said, who has caused your sight to come back? <coughs> now look at the jalees. Look at the king's friend, the one who sits with the king, his wazir. He doesn't hide the fact that he's a believer. He says, Qala Rabbi. So he says, Qala walaka Rabbim ghayri. Do you have a Lord other than me? Fir'aun of the time. Fir'aun of the time. So the man says, Qala Rabbi wa Rabbuk Allah. My Lord and your Lord is Allah. So look how the da'wah of the young Ghulam, who is in the street, has reached even the throne of the king. To the extent the king feels the throne is now shaking. So the king took the wazir and he began to punish him. So from one minute he was his wazir and his friend. The next minute he became his enemy and he was being tortured. And wallahi Look at this, this man who is the wazir of the king. He's not afraid that now that he's going to make it out of his iman, that he's going to now, as a result of that, receive this punishment. And it reminds us the story of the magicians of the time of Fir'aun. When they came to Musa salam and they bought their tricks, and they saw that Musa -Salam overcame them and they recognized, because they were magicians, they recognized that Musa -Salam didn't have sorcery. This was something far greater than that. And they believed in him. <coughs> that we believe 
We believed in the Lord of Musa and Harun. So as a result of what happened, then he started to warn them, I'm going to cut your hands and I'm going to crucify you and I'm going to cut your feet on the opposite sides and I'm going to crucify you. What did they say? Do what you like. The thing that is important to us, we found our Lord and to Him will return. Whatever you do in this dunya, it is nothing. And such is Iman that a person realizes the haqqara of this dunya. And how short-lived it is. And the say of the Akhirah. And his blessings. And that is forever. So as a result of that. The jalees of the king. He remained steadfast upon Iman. But the king very, very quickly. As soon as he heard this dawah. He realized that this is the beginning of my end. Unless I crush these people. Because that's the thing about dawah. The truth when it comes in will always prevail. The truth will always prevail. And then what will it do? Why do they dislike this truth? Because it will prevent them from the battle that they do. And it will prevent them from experiencing the shahwat that they want. So they want, the king wants in one fell swoop to extinguish this. If he can find out who the people who are responsible and he can finish them off, then this da'wah, da'wah al haq won't spread. So he continued to punish the man. And he continued to punish him until he came to know about who were the people behind this da'wah. And you'll see that the da'iyah, any person who is calling to the truth, he will face problems. This is part and parcel of a da'wah in Allah. And when you call to the truth, you will experience problems. And these problems, what are they for? Because you hold on to La ilaha illallah. And as a result of that, what happens? Because you hold on to that, you will experience these difficulties. And we see that in the time of the Prophet وسلم, the companions of the Prophet Ammar ibn Yasir. Ammar ibn Yasir is just one example of how many. Ammar and Yasir. Both of them. Yasser was killed, first punished, then tortured, and then eventually killed. And also his mother, Sumayya, Ammar's brother, mother. She was also killed. And Ammar, what happened to him? He was tortured within an inch of his life. And they wouldn't leave him alone until he was made to say something about the Prophet. So then, after he said that, they released him. And he came to the Prophet to complain. He said, Ya Rasulullah, I said something. And it was only because of their torturing that I said it. So the Prophet said, How do you find yourself now? So he said, My heart is satisfied with faith. So the Prophet said that it has not affected you then. So under torture, Ammar, the son of Yasir, said something about the person. But look, he didn't affect his faith. So this is the, always the situation that a doubt of haq. When it comes, people see that it is a threat to them. And as a result of that, they want to crush it and stop it. So this jalees of the king, what did he do? When he was being tortured, he told them about the body. So now the boy is brought. فَجِئْ بِالْغُلَامِ فَقَالَ لَهُ مَلِكِ إِبْنَيْ قَدْ بَلَغَ مِنْ سِحْرِكَ مَا تُبْرِئُ الْأَكْمَهَ وَالْأَبْرَسَ وَتَفَلُوا وَتَفَلُوا If you look at this sentence that the king is saying, he says that when he brought the king, he said to him, Oh young boy, your magic has caused you to arrive at such a state that now you can cure people with leprosy and with other illnesses. So what is he saying? He said, because of your magic. Because of their magic. So the boy replied, فَقَالَ إِنِّي لَا أَشْفِي أَحْدِ إِنَّ مَا أَشْفِي اللَّهِ He said, I don't cure anybody. Allah is the one who cures. So then, the king began to punish him. فَأَخَذَهُ فَلَمْ يَزَلْ يُعَذِبُ حَتَّى دَلَّا نَبْرَاهِ If you just stop at these few sentences that were said here. When the king came to the boy, or when he brought the boy, 
And he said to him, oh, because of your magic, you arrived at such and such. The uslub, the way that he's speaking to him, it seems like there is love in it. But there is no love in it. There is no love in it. This is a way to extract from him information. <coughs> As the poet says, وَإِذَا رَأَيْتَ الْيُوبَ الْلَيْثِ بَارِزًا فَلَا تَظُنُنَّ عَنَّ الْلَيْثِ يَبْتَسِمًا Don't think that when the lion bears its teeth that it's smiling at you. Because behind it is something else. The king had a hadith. What was his hadith? That he wants to extract from him information, the truth. So what can he do? Then he can crush his dawah with one fair swoop. But look at the boy and his iman. Still he's calling to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He say, I'm not the one who cures, Allah is the one who cures. Now the message has reached the throne itself. <coughs> Brothers and sisters, the truth, to say the truth is one thing, but then to say the truth in, term, in front of an oppressive ruler is the greatest expression of truth, the Prophet said. To say that in the court of the king, that requires Bravery, which is unsurmountable. So difficult to be that brave that you say the truth in front of this power. But the, kid, the boy, look at his iman. He's only a boy. But because of his iman, he's able to do that. Because of his iman, he is able to do that. So we find that now the king has arrived at the boy. <coughs> But he doesn't want to stop there. He wants to find the root of the problem. If you take a weed from its roots, you've removed it forever. And if you just chop off, chop off the top of it, it is only more, it's only for a small period of time. So he continued to punish him and to torture him until he arrived at the source. And who is the source? The Rai. And the boy promised not to say, but under torture, he's forced to say. Like Ammar was forced to say. Like Ammar was forced to say. We find the companions of the Prophet wasallam. They went through a similar period in, in their lives. If you look at the Dawah of the Prophet wasallam, in the stages when it was still severe, when it was still hidden, the people that came to Iman, who were the people that came to Iman? It's a false notion to say that only the poor and the meek, the weak people came to Iman. This is incorrect. When the Prophet called to Iman, of course we know that from his home, Khadija, she accepted Iman. Waraka bin Nawfal, who heard about the incident in the cave of Hira, accepted Iman. Ali radiallahu anhu, Zayd ibn Harith, they accepted Iman straight away. And Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu was one of the few people that when he heard about this Iman, he didn't have any interrupted. He didn't say, let me think about it. Let me ask some more questions. Let me read a few books. He accepted Iman. And then the fruit of that is what? Within a very small period of time, say, now Abu Bakr is a die. Straight away, look what he does. Who were the people that came to faith first? Uthman ibn Affan. At the age of 34, the first person that said Abu Bakr called to Iman, and he accepted Iman. Abdul Rahman ibn Awf, at the age of 30, were these the poor people, the weak people of Mecca? They were from the Ashraf of Mecca. Abu Bakr was one of those people that the people should see, seek to go and sit with him, to learn from him. Because of his knowledge of Tijar, because of his knowledge of the Qabai. Abdul Rahman ibn Awf was one of the richest people. Of also from amongst the people that came to Imam Sahih ibn Abi Waqqas. Sahih ibn Abi Waqqas is also one of the great, uh, from, from one of the tribes and one of the great leaders in Islam. Abu Ubaidah was one of the first people. And there are many, many examples of people who were of noble families who came to Imam. Not the weak and the destitute as we are led to believe, falsely. This is one of the things that some of the people who talk about Sira from the Muslim volume from the Orientalists. What did they say? Well, that the people that came to Iman, they were the ones who had no life. So they hoped to find rights with the Prophet. This is incorrect. In fact, of those people, the first 40 or 50 people that accepted Iman, most of them were from wealthy families, 
from noble families. So this is a notion that we should dismiss. Brothers and sisters, now the Tao has become known, the king knows about it. And the king has come to learn about the Rahi because the boy has told him about it. And as a result of that, now the king, he bought the Rahi. فَقِيلَ لَهُ إِرْجِعَ عَنْ دِينِكِ So when the Rahim is bought, when the monk is bought, he, the king orders him, leave your religion. Leave your religion. فَأَبَى So he refused. فَدَعَى بِالْمِنْشَاءِ فَوَضَى بِالْمِنْشَاءِ فِي مَفْرِقْ رَأْسِي فَشَقَّهُ حَتَّى وَقَعْ شِقَاءِ Then he was placed and a sore was brought and it was put upon his head and he was cut into two portions until he became two portions. And then the jalees of the king, he was brought and he was ordered the same thing, leave your religion. So he refused. So they took him and sawed him in half two. And then, of course, now what's left is the boy. But if you remember, last week when we started to talk about this qissa, where did we start? <coughs> the story of Khabbab ibn Art. And this is the story of Khabbab. He says, he narrates, he says, Shakawna ila Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa huwa mutawassidun burdatan lahu fi dhil al kaaba He said, we came to the Prophet and we complained that the Prophet was wearing a particular cloak and he was under the shade of the Kaaba. We said to him, He said, oh, We said to the Prophet, O oh, Messenger of Allah, don't you invoke Allah's help for us so that we are helped. So the Prophet said, There is a man standing. The Prophet said that a man from before you would be bought and that a pit would be dug and then he would be put in it and then a soul would be bought and the person would be cut into two portions and this would not prevent him from his deed. And the Prophet said that a man would be combed by a metal comb until he would remove his flesh from his bones and this would not turn him back from his religion. And then the Prophet said Wallahi la yutimman Allah hadha al Hatta yasiru raqibu min sana'ala hadha al mawt la yakhafu in Allah aw al-dhib ala ghanamihi wa la kinna kun tasta'ajun Then the Prophet prophesied something. He said to him Indeed, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will cause this matter to be completed in the Islam to be spread to the extent that a traveler would travel from Sana'a which is in Yemen to Hadar al Maut and he would not fear anything except Allah and the sheep and the and the sheep that would be predated upon by the wolf. That's the only thing he would have to fear. <coughs> but you are a people who are in hurry. If you look at the story of Khabbab, Khabbab was one of those people when he heard about Islam, he was one of the, he was among the Dufa al second group of people who accepted Islam. And when he accepted Islam, some people came to him and they asked him about his Islam. They said, we've heard that you have become a Muslim. So he said, yes, I've become a Muslim. They used the derogatory term, it's a bat. So he said, I have believed in Allah and I believe that Muhammad is the message of Allah. And as soon as he said those words, they began to beat him with whatever they had, hammers, with their hands, with their fists. And when they left him, he was only blood, covered in blood. And they beat him so severely to the extent that some of the companions, they say, it's narrated Bukhari, Qais, he says, Atayna Khabbab ibn Arab ibn Aoud. 
that we came to Khabab Al to say our condolences to him about, Ill, about what had happened to him. Waqad Iktawa Saban, that he was burnt seven times with iron, branded with iron seven times. So he said something. Look at Khabab. We said Khabab that he came to complain to the Prophet. I want to demonstrate to you that Khabab's complaint wasn't empty. What would we have done in Khabab's place? He says, Lawla anna Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam nahana annadu bin mawti illa da'utu bi. He said, if Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam hadn't forbidden us for asking for death, I would have asked for death. So when Khabab comes to the person to complain, he has something to complain about. To the extent that Amir al-Mu'mineen Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anhu, Khabab ibn Arath came to his majlis, and Umar came down from his chair and sat him on the chair. And Umar said, by Allah, nobody in this world has more right to this chair than you after Bilal. After Bilal. And we don't have to Bilal again. So Khabab said, Bilal was somebody who had somebody to look, up, to look, up, look up, out for him. And I had nobody. Because who was looking out for, Khabab, for uh, Bilal? Abu Bakr Siddiq al Bilal. But Khabab, he said, I had nobody. They tortured me and tortured me until they thought that I would die. And then they left. So brothers and sisters, when Khabab comes to complain about the ta'rib that they are facing, then he is justified in complaining about that. Now, the Jalees has been killed. And the Rahib have been killed. And time has already escaped us. Inshallah, we will conclude this story next week. But brothers, what do we find? In this story, an ayah comes to mind. Those who strive in our paths, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guides them. Guides them toward to his path. All of us, we are ordered to be jihad in Allah. Allah has given us the truth. And one thing that you noticed, which we didn't point out yet, is that the king, when he called these people, he didn't make mujadala with them. He didn't try and argue with them and bring his hujaj. He had nothing. This is always the case with people who are bothered, that they don't have hujaj. All they have is might. So all he could do was kill them, exercise his power on them. If he had the truth, then he would have argued with them, with proofs. As such, we leave the story at its highest point. The boy in the court of the king. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us a people who hear the truth, recognize the people who give us the ability to act upon and also make us a people who come and hear the false of recognize the false and give us the ability to avoid the people who are Alhamdulillah <laughs> كما صليت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم إنك حميد مجيد اللهم بارك على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما باركت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم إنك حميد مجيد ورض الله من أربعة الخلفاء الراشدين المهديين أبو بكر وعمر وعثمان وعلي وعن شعر أصحاب نبيك أجمعين ونحن بيت الطيبين الطاهرين ورض الله معنا مجنك وكرمك وجودك يا أرحم الراحمين اللهم عز الإسلام والمسلمين اللهم عز الإسلام والمسلمين اللهم عز الإسلام والمسلمين واضل الشرك والمشركين ودمر عجاء الدين وحمي حوز الإسلام يا رب العالمين اللهم اغفر للمؤمنين والمؤمنات الأحياء من الأموات رضا رحمكم الله إن الله يأمر بالعدل والإحسان وإنتاء القربة وينهى الفحشاء والمنكر والبغي عنكم لعلكم تذكرون أذكر الله الذي يذكركم وادعوه يستجيبكم ولذكر الله أكبر
Allah'ı anlatsın. Allah'ı